Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the children of Herod. Herod the Great died in 4 BC. He had had a number of wives. I've only got four of them listed here. Um, Mariamne, she had been the last of the Hasmoneans, uh, the, that former um, dynasty of Jewish priests turned kings. And by Mariamne, Herod had two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. Unfortunately, uh, he ended up having both of those sons put to death. He actually had Mariamne murdered, uh, had her executed um, because she was accused of being unfaithful to him. And he uncovered plots to have himself assassinated and replaced with his two sons. The same thing happened to the, his son by Doris, uh, Antipater. So that three of his sons that he had, had executed, Antipater was actually killed just a, a week or two before the death of Herod himself. We also have uh, Malthaki, who gave birth to both Archelaus and Ant Antipas. Now, both of these sons not only survived, but they were going to be the heirs of Herod. Uh, when Herod dies, Archelaus becomes the ruler of Judea and Samaria, and Antipas has, he's given a tetrarchy, he's the, he's the younger son of Galilee. And then finally, we have another queen by the name of Mariamne, and she gives birth to Herod Philip, who will be given a portion of land to the east of Galilee. Now, we're going to, let me just flesh out the rest of the family. Uh, we'll look at them now, and then we'll be talking about who they are. Uh, Aristobulus is going to marry a Berniki and have three children. Uh, of those, two of them are going to be especially significant to us, uh, Agrippa I and Herodias. And then Herodias will marry Philip, and she will have a, they will have a daughter by the name of Salome. She is not mentioned by name, but she is mentioned in the gospel accounts. She's the one, remember, who, who dances before Antipas uh, and says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And finally, Agrippa will have actually four children, but we're only going to look at three. Uh, Drusilla, Agrippa II, and Bernike. Uh, and they're all going to be mentioned in the book of Acts, and we'll see uh, Drusilla's husband, Felix. So that's the lineup. That's where we're headed in today's talk. Now, Israel in the first century was made up of several provinces. You had Galilee in the north, Samaria uh, about halfway toward the south, and then Judea in the south. Meanwhile, on the east side of the Jordan, north of the Jabbok River, you had the region known as the Decapolis. Uh, that word Decapolis just means the ten cities. And then to the south of that, you had the region known as Perea. So those were the various lands and provinces which now made up uh, the former promised land, the former land of Israel. We want to begin by looking at the career of Herod Antipas. Um, after all, he's going to be playing a good part uh, in the gospel accounts. Antipas had been given upon the death of uh, his father, Herod the Great, the Tetrarchy, the, te the word Tetrarch means the ruler of a fourth part, the Tetrarchy of Galilee and Perea. Notice these two areas are not connected, but that's okay. It was a little, a little bit of a, a, a patchwork of kingdoms that he is ruling over. He took in marriage the daughter of Aretas, who was king of Arabia. This was a political marriage, and, and this guaranteed that there would be peace between the king of Arabia and uh, these regions of Galilee and Samaria and Perea, and, uh, th these areas which now belong to Rome. Uh, remember that Arabia and Rome, they're two separate kingdoms. Arabia was not under the control of Rome. And so that meant that the area that we look at as Palestine with Galilee and Samaria, these, these were buffer states. Uh, and very important uh, kingdoms to Rome because they would be buffers against the non-Roman places. And so this marriage was supposed to guarantee an alliance. And all went well until Antipas happened to be visiting some family and he got reacquainted with his niece Herodias, who was married to Antipas's half-brother, um, and they they fell in love. In fact, they fell 
hopelessly in love. And and Herodias ended up running away from her husband, leaving her husband, to go and marry Antipas. Now, that's adultery. And it was it was recognized as adultery. Let's let's look at the family lineup. Uh, we have Antipas, notice in red, uh, and then we have Philip, who was married to Herodias. Uh, you say, gee, aren't they sort of close to be married? Well, yeah, perhaps, but they were doing that, that sort of thing back then. Uh, and then Herodias had left Philip to go and marry now Antipas. And as we said, that's adultery. And so John the Baptist, who was preaching repentance and announcing the coming of the Messiah, of course, um, the Messiah hadn't showed up yet, and, and then, then shortly there, uh, thereafter Jesus shows up and, and John baptizes him and announces, that's the one, that's the one I've been waiting for. But John also, in his preaching of repentance, pointed out that there were some public figures that needed to repent. Um, specifically Antipas and Herodias, because Antipas was committing adultery by having had by having taken his brother's wife. Well, that made him persona non grata. That made him very unpopular with Antipas, and Antipas arrested John the Baptist and put him in a prison in Perea. Uh, we actually know the name of the prison. There's a there's a uh, fortress there on the southern part of Perea called uh, 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 Malcheras. And so the Macarius Fortress was the place where John the Baptist was being held. And, of course, you remember the story where John the Baptist was, was finally executed and the, this arrangement where the daughter of Herodias had danced for Antipas. And, and he said, I'll give you what he was trying to act like a king. He wasn't a king. Uh, I'll give you anything you want, even to the, to the fourth of my kingdom. Well, he didn't. It wasn't his kingdom to give. It was it was a Roman kingdom. He was he was speaking bigger than he was able to deliver, um, but he ended up um, he ended up uh, uh, giving into that request and having John the Baptist executed. But meanwhile, some some issues began to arise. Remember, I said that Antipas had taken Herodias. Well, wait a second. He had already had a wife, the daughter of Aretas. What happened there? You couldn't have. You weren't allowed to have more than one wife, especially under Roman law. Uh, the Jews sometimes did this. It was thought that Herod the Great had 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 more than one wife at a time. I'm not sure about that. We're not told very clearly, but he uh, he either had lots of divorces or perhaps he had practiced uh, that level of polygamy. But in the case of Antipas, uh, what had happened is he had he had said, "Well, you know, I yes, I have this wife, but if she has an accident." Then, then we can get married. And so he and Herodias conspired to maybe give uh, that wife a, a, have her have an accident, and she learned of the plans. And she went, went running home to Daddy, and he was so angry that a war was about to break out now between Arabia and Rome, but specifically against, against uh, Antipas and Galilee and Perea. So that the 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 uh, governor of Syria was needed to bring legions down to fight against the king of Arabia, and this was just turning into a terrible mess. Now, fortunately, uh, Antipas was removed before the uh, and actually the emperor. And they they went through a change of emperors. Uh, the emperor died, and everything turned out okay, and and war was averted. Uh, but as a result, we're going to see that Antipas is going to get end up in very hot water. But to tell that story, we now have to go to the nephew of Herod Antipas. And so now we're going to look at Agrippa. Notice we're calling them all Herod, you know, Herod this, Herod that, because they, they all wanted to be named after dear old father, or in this case, grandfather. Um, so Herod Agrippa, his father is one of those sons that had been executed by Herod the Great in, in 7 BC. Uh, here, let's look at Agrippa. This is his family line. And notice that he's the brother of Herodias. So that makes him closer to Antipas than Antipas might have wished because Herodias said left her, her husband and gone to marry Antipas. And after a while, that's going to bring Agrippa into the household of Antipas as well. 
So Agrippa had been educated in Rome, had had some of the finest uh, uh, tutors, and had had some of the finest classmates as well. But he found himself moving in, taking residence in Tiberias with Antipas, um, primarily because he was short of funds and, and he had lots of debts, whether they were gambling or whatever. He had a tendency to spend a lot of money and get in trouble with his creditors. And of course, uh, Antipas was not all that delighted to have this uh, nephew slash brother-in-law move in with him. And so he would frequently debase and insult Aunt, uh, Agrippa, and the two of them did not get along at all. And so finally Agrippa returned to Rome, where he reacquainted himself with an old friend of his, uh, Caligula, a uh, young man they had actually studied together back when they had been kids in Rome, and now they got reacquainted, and, and Caligula had an, he was the nephew to the emperor, the emperor Tiberius. And one day, Agrippa and Caligula were out riding their horses, and Agrippa happened to remark, you know, if your uncle were to die, you would make a fabulous emperor. Well, unfortunately, there were slaves or somebody nearby who reported the conversation back to uh, the emperor Tiberius. And Agrippa was arrested and he was thrown into prison. And there he remained in chains in prison. Until one day he happened to notice that, and I don't know if it was through the window, but, but he happened to notice an owl standing there looking at him. And, and he thought, well, that's sort of odd. Owls don't usually come into the presence of people. They're, they're usually sort of isolated. And this owl was sitting there. And no sooner had he noticed the owl looking at him when guards came to say, oh, you've now been released. Something, something has happened very significant. What had happened is that Tiberius had died, and now his old friend Caligula had become the Caesar. And the very first thing that Caligula did, he said, release my friend Agrippa. Take those chains off him and weigh the weight of the chains, and I want that amount of gold given to my friend Agrippa because he believed in me. In fact, he believed in me so much that he had been imprisoned on my behalf. And so Agrippa now is awarded the title of king, and he is given the Tetrarchy of Philip, uh, Traconti, uh, Traconitis, a uh, little, little tiny kingdom on the east side of the upper Jordan, um, and given that title of king. And Antipas, who has... Remember Antipas, and we'd had Antipas uh, being, uh, being there as the Tetrarch and had been married now for some time to his wife Herodias, the, the brother of Agrippa. And perhaps it was the, the, at the suggestion of Herodias who, who said, you know, I, I, yes, it's been nice being married to you, but I'd really like to be married to a king. Why don't you go ask the new emperor, and maybe he'll make you a king too. After all, he made my brother a king. Maybe he can do the same thing for you. And so Antipas, remember Antipas and Agrippa, they hated each other, but Antipas goes to Rome and he, he is there asking that the emperor make him a king as well. And Agrippa leans over and perhaps whispers in the ear, of the emperor, uh, why don't you ask him about all of those weapons he has stockpiled uh, as a preparation to revolt, maybe, against Rome? Uh, now, I don't know if Antipas had ever pl been planning on revolting against Rome, but he did have the weapons stockpiled, and it had been sort of a, cl a closely guarded secret, and, and when asked about it, he had to admit, yes, you, we've got you know, 70,000 uh, sets of armor and, and swords and shields and all these weapons. And so immediately, Antipas goes from being the Tetrarch to being nothing. <laughs> He's actually removed from office and banished to Spain. Now, Herodias is told, now, uh, your husband has been banished. You don't have to be banished. You can, you can continue to stay in land. But she says, no, I'm going to go with my husband. And so Herodias and Antipas leave for Spain, and we never hear from them again. 
And now Agrippa becomes the king, not just of Trachonitis. In fact, he actually gave up uh, Trachonitis. But he becomes king now of Galilee and Samaria and Judea. So these now become his territory. It's like a returning to the old Herod the Great. So we're, we, we can really call him Herod Agrippa. Next, there's a temple incident that takes place with Caligula. Uh, Caligula has been reading reports of things that are happening around his empire, and there's been a little bit of unrest there in in Judea and, uh, and in the land of Israel. And he says, you know, what those Jewish people need, they need a God that you can see. After all, you go into any temple in the Roman world, whether it's a temple of, of Jupiter or of, of Mercury or of Mars, and in all of these temples, they have, they have statues of the gods. And those poor old Jews, they don't have a statue of their God. They need a God they can see. They need a statue of me. And so he sends word to the governor of Syria, go down to Jerusalem and put a statue of the emperor in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. (laughs) Well, you can imagine what that's going to do. And Agrippa immediately goes to Rome and, and to talk Caligula down from his plans. Uh, and uh, he meets with Caligula and he says, you can't do that. That's, that's going to that's gonna create such a rebellion. Um, you know, it will just bring the roof down. And likewise, the governor of Syria, instead of responding by taking the statue down there, he also sends a letter to Rome. His name was uh, Petronius. Sends a letter to Rome saying, you really need to, to think about this. And Caligula relents. He says, okay, uh, I won't do that. Uh, however, that governor that didn't immediately obey my order, that Governor Petronius, uh, have him executed. Now, the good news is that Caligula himself was assassinated shortly thereafter, so the order for the execution of Petronius did not take place, and the crisis was averted, and you have no uh, statue of Caligula in the temple. But it's interesting because right around this time, the Apostle Paul writes an epistle, a second epistle to the Thessalonians, where he talks about something standing in the holy place that shouldn't be there. And it, you can't help but wonder, is he alluding, at least in part, to these series of events that have been taking place? Well, Agrippa now is back in, in Judea. And he orders the arrest of both James, James the brother of John, and of Peter. And James is actually executed, and Peter is scheduled for execution when he is supernaturally delivered. You can read about that in Acts chapter 12. After that, Agrippa is back in his capital at Caesarea. Of course, that was the capital of the entire region. And a delegation from Sidon, one of the Phoenician cities up the coast, have come to meet with him. And he comes out to address the delegation, and he's clothed in these, this sparkling raiment. Uh, perhaps it had precious stones um, so, sort of sewn into the fabric. And the sun hits it, and it is glittering, and it is, it's like a light show, and nobody's ever seen anything like this. And the crowd begins to call uh, out, he's a god, he's a god. And they begin to worship Agrippa. Both Acts 12, as well as Josephus, tell the same story, although Josephus adds the little note that as they begin to worship him and he accepts their worship, he's standing there and he looks up and there above him is perched an owl a symbol, a reminder, a portend that something's about to change. And suddenly Agrippa doubles over in pain and he collapses there, right there. And after a, an agonizing few days, he dies. And Agrippa, the, the king who would be God, the one who set himself against the apostles of Jesus, has died. Now, Agrippa left several children 
Um, we're going to look first at Agrippa II. Now, he didn't call himself. He just calls himself after the name of his father. And so here's the uh, sort of the family tree. We have uh, Agrippa having actually four children, but I'm not going to, there, there was a, a, a daughter named Mary Amney. I'm not going to talk about her. And so we have uh, Bernike, and I'm going from right to left, Bernike, uh, Agrippa II, and Drusilla, and we're going to see Drusilla married to Felix, and, and we'll get into that. We're going to talk about each one of these, but I want to begin with Agrippa II. Uh, Agrippa II was favored by Claudius, uh, who had been emperor, but now there's been a change of emperor. So instead of Claudius, Claudius himself has, has died, and there's a new emperor. So we went from Caligula to Claudius, now the emperor Nero. And Nero makes Agrippa II the king of Calis. Uh, that's a little tiny area, again, on the, it's so, sort of where you train people to be rulers. And, and so you, you can think of him as a ruler in training. And he's given the Tetrarchy of Philip, um, this little tiny area to the northeast of the Sea of Galilee. And Nero also gave him Tiberias and a few other cities in Galilee. So uh, he, gradually his, his little kingdom is beginning to grow and to develop. He reigned from Caesarea Philippi. It's actually just off our map to the northeast. And he renames it in honor of his patron, Nero. He renames it Neronias. As such, he is given the authority to appoint the high priest and also to hold on to the priestly vestments. That's something the procurators had had. But they think, well, this will perhaps work better if a Jewish ruler, because remember that Agrippa II is part Jewish and, and considers himself Jewish, and people considered himself as such, uh, and it would be better if he was holding on to the priestly the vestments of the high priest. Now, there's some rumors going around because he has three sisters, but of them, uh, he's spending quite a lot of time with his sister Bernike, and we're going to look at her next, and we'll see that she had been through some marriages, but she, spent, she ends up being with Agrippa. Now, it's, it's Agrippa II and Bernike and Drusilla and her husband that are all going to encounter the Apostle Paul when they come to Caesarea. And, of course, Acts tells the story about this, this family reunion of, of the, the two sisters and the brother and a brother-in-law, and they're, they've all gathered together. And in this gathering, it's brought up that, you know, we have this prisoner, he's, and we've been holding on to him for the last two years. His name is Paul. They, the, the Christians refer to him as an apostle. And he is allowed to come and address them and to tell his story. And, of course, Paul never misses the opportunity to share the gospel. And so they heard about Jesus and how he had died and risen from the dead. And they hear the whole story. And the question is, what will they do about it? Now I want to look at Bernike. Bernike, as I said, had been through a number of marriages. Uh, she was, while still a teenager, maybe about 14, 15 years old, uh, married to Marcus Julius Alexander. Um, his brother at the time had been the procurator. And actually, he was also the nephew of a well-known writer, uh, well-known writer philosopher, uh, Philo of Alexandria. So it was a very distinguished family uh, in, into which she had married. But he died shortly thereafter, and so she now remarried, still a teenager, and married to her uncle Herod of uh, uh, Calis. Um, and with this marriage, she actually had two sons. So this marriage, but then after the birth of these two sons, he also died. Of course, he was older, so don't, it's not that she's killing her husbands. 
Next, she is married to Paul Limon II, king of Cilicia. And remember, Paul of Tarsus. Tarsus is located in Cilicia, so perhaps there was this little bit of sort of connection uh, as he, um, as uh, she had been married to him. Uh, it was rumored, and Josephus actually passes on the rumor, that this marriage was arranged, first of all, by this time she had quite a bit of wealth, uh, so he's in it for the money. Um, but also it was arranged because there were rumors beginning to be floated around that she seems to spend quite a lot of time with her brother Agrippa II and that maybe they were doing something inappropriate. So, so perhaps this was to dispel that rumor, but in any case, uh, she soon deserted that husband and came back to stay with her brother. And of course, that's where we see them as they meet with the Apostle Paul. So she returns to Agrippa II, and then after that scenario with the Apostle Paul, and they're still living, we have in 66 AD where the Jews revolt against Rome. And Agrippa does what he can do to try to quell the revolt, but it is all to no avail, and he is driven out with his sister out of the city of Jerusalem, and the revolt is underway, and the Romans initially send a legion down from Syria to put down the revolt, and the legion is destroyed, unheard of, to lose an entire legion. But the Romans don't quit, for now they will send not one, but three legions under the command of a uh, a grizzled old general by the name of Vespasian. And Vespasian calls for his son, Titus, to go down and pick up a fourth legion from Egypt, and he does so. And so they converge now upon the land of Israel. And over the next three or three, well, uh, next three years, they will conquer and subdue the land, culminating in Jerusalem. Now, while Titus has come, um, Bernike gets the opportunity to meet her. After all, her brother, uh, Agrippa, is fighting on the side of the Romans. And Bernike is a bit older than Titus, but they meet and they fall, both of them fall hopelessly in love. And they, they take up residence together. After the fall of Jerusalem, Titus uh, returns to Rome, and Bernike follows him, and there they are living together. And Titus wants to marry her, but his father will have none of it. And remember, in, under the Roman family, um, the father rules everything. The father is the one who decides. And so Titus is forced to break it off with Bernike, and we're not going to see her again. But now I want to look over at Drusilla, the other sister, the youngest sister. She'd been the youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa I, uh, named after the sister of Caligula. And she had been only a child at the death of her father and could remember some of the nasty things that people were saying about her father and about how God had killed him. Uh, and so she was married to uh, Azizus of uh, Emesa, but she left her husband she was only 16 years old at the time, left her husband to go and marry Felix, who would become the procurator of Judea. Now, Felix himself had actually been, in his early life, he'd been a slave who had um, been sort of a, a favorite of the wife of the emperor and had been freed and then had risen to prominence even to become the procurator of Judea. And now uh, Felix and Drusilla became something of an item. In her later life, after the fall of Jerusalem, she would uh, be settled in, in uh, the city of Pompeii. And in 79 AD, when the mountain blew up, this this uh, volcano erupted and buried the cities on either side of the mountain, uh, Herculeum and and Pompeii, and she died uh, with her son in that eruption, bringing an end to the line of the Herods. So if we could go back 
to that day when they had all met with the Apostle Paul. And there's a striking verse, Acts chapter 26, verse 29, uh, 28, I'm sorry, where uh, Agrippa, after hearing Paul's gospel message, he says, you know, in a short time, you will pers- persuade me <laughs> to become a Christian. And, of course, Paul says, well, there's no time like the present. Uh, uh, I, I would wish that you would be like me. Not, not the chains, but I wish that you and all of the Jewish people could be like me. And it makes you wonder about the end of the story. You see, some of those that were there would live a bit longer and then die. Uh, some, like Agrippa, would live quite a bit longer before he would die. And so I can't help but wonder, did he ever come to believe? And yet the bigger question, have you come to believe? Have you been persuaded 